Vale, pues eh, ahora vamos a escuchar a Harry Ekman, que viene de Portugal, donde están trabajando muchísimos programas de gestión de colonias de TNR. Eh, Harry trabaja para el Change for Animal Foundation y también ha recibido el, el, el premio del Bienestar Felino del International Cat Care este año, en el 2016. Eh, o sea que somos compañeros de premios. ¿eh? Eh, hemos pedido a Harry que hable del factor humano en la gestión de colonias. Es decir, que por una vez vamos a hablar de las personas, todas las personas, las que cuidan, las que aman, las que odian, las que trabajan en la administración, etc. Eh, porque pensamos que es un tema importante, ahora que se están desarrollando muchos programas TNR en, en España, que se hable también de todas las personas, todos los actores involucrados en estos programas. Uh, buenos días. Buen día. Um, firstly, I have to apologize because that's the only Spanish that you're going to get from me today. Um, I'm sorry, I have to speak to you in English. I'm going to try and speak a little slower so that the translator in the back there can keep up with me. Um, I have no idea what Agnes just said uh, to introduce me. Um, if it was good things, then it's true. Um, if it was bad things, then it's not. Um, So, my name is Harry. I, I um, run an organization called Change for Animals Foundation. I'm a co-founder and director. And I also work as a consultant for the International Fund for Animal Welfare. And with both organizations, um, I work on stray animal problems, cats and dogs. And today, I'm going to be talking about cats. But in particular, I'm going to be talking about cats and people and the relationship between the two with the work that we are doing. Um, so to begin with, um, I'd like to ask anybody in the audience who works with or volunteers for uh, a, an animal NGO, a cat welfare organization, if you can just show your hands so I can have an idea. It's quite a few. Uh, and uh, anybody who is a vet or a veterinary nurse or a veterinary technician, if I could see your hands as well, okay. And is there anybody here from uh, the municipalities around Spain or anywhere else? A show of hands? Okay, well that's good. Uh, I guess if you didn't put your hand up, you're, you're maybe thinking you're in the wrong place, but you're not. Um, so I'm going to ask, um, when you think of uh, stray cats or street cats or feral cats, what is the first thing that comes into your head? Do you think of something like this? This is a, a street cat in Sri Lanka who I met last year. He lives in a fish market. Actually, it's a she. She lives in a fish market. She's quite well cared for. Uh, she likes the camera. She likes having her picture taken. So when you think of a street cat, do you think of something like this? Or if I say, when, what do you think of when you think of street cats? Do you think of this? Do you think of uh, a feeder like this? This is a woman in Greece who feeds a local colony of cats. And obviously there are people like this everywhere around the world. Or do you think of this? Dustbins and cats causing a nuisance or making a mess. Or this, if you're on holiday, when you think of street cats, is this the picture that comes into your head? Sitting at a cafe, having lunch, and having cats around you, hoping to get some scraps of food. Or do you think of this? Do you think of a, a, a sick cat on the streets with nobody to care for it? Uh, this is a cat in India. Um, has skin cancer on its ears, probably its nose as well, may have FELV, FIV, cat flu, um, but it's not in a good condition. Or maybe you think of kittens, skinny kittens like these guys also on the street of India. Or maybe you think of this. Maybe you think of a successful TNR project. This is a cat in Praia de Faro, in the south of Portugal, where I run a project. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it later. But maybe you think of this, a healthy looking cat, ear tipped, flank spay, you can see a tiny little scar on its side there. The point is, 
that none of these images are wrong. And we all have different perspectives and different thoughts in our head when we think about cats. And it depends what our uh, motivations are and uh, what our priorities are. So when we work around the world, and I'm going to talk generally, but there are a lot of parallels with here in Spain. Um, but what are the common issues that people talk about or think about when they think of stray cats? Well, we have these. These are the concerns. These are the issues. These are the things that within the communities that we live in, people talk about. There are too many cats. People will often say that. Or they'll say there's skinny cats or diseased cats or kittens that are dying on the street. These are the negative things that people are concerned about. Maybe they talk about people feeding cats. Maybe they like it, maybe they don't. But there are issues related to, with that. Some people don't like colonies of cats congregating in areas because they have issues with the food being left out, rotting or just looking horrible on the street or attracting mice or birds or insects. You could have tourists feeding cats. Some tourists love to go to places and see the cats, but other tourists don't. And hotels and cafes and restaurants usually don't like cats hanging out outside of their uh, premises. You have rubbish bins, bags being torn open, again, making a mess, making a nuisance. These are all concerns that people regularly raise about stray cats. Zoonosis, transferable diseases, traffic accidents, both from the perspective of the cat being hit by a car and being injured, or causing car accidents, you know, slamming on the brakes when a cat runs across the street. Then you have noise from cats outside your window at three o'clock in the morning. We, we know that noise. I'm thinking whether I should do an impression of that noise. I'll do an impression. We all know that sound. So that, you know, do you, is that a concern? Nobody likes to hear that at three o'clock in the morning. People sheltering or hoarding cats. You have people who keep cats in their, you know, in their property, in their house, and the neighbors will often complain about that. And then also the, the problem of everywhere being a litter tray. Uh, in Praia de Faro, it's four and a half kilometers of beach, which is also four and a half kilometers of litter tray, which is great for the cats. But when we look at this, how many of these things are to do with the actual welfare of the cats? The thing that we as animal welfare people care about. Well, it's only four. Skinny cats, diseased cats, dying kittens, road traffic accidents. These are the things that directly affect the cats. You could argue that mating and fighting has a, an indirect effect. You know, cat fights cause injuries. But really, these are the four things that directly affect cat welfare. Everything else is how the cats affect people, the concerns that people have. And even the things that affect the welfare of the cats may be viewed differently by people. We might care about the cats being skinny and underfed or diseased, but somebody in a community might go, I just don't like seeing skinny cats or sick cats. So it's not how it affects the cats, but it's how seeing that affects them. So these are all things that we have to bear in mind when we're planning projects and we're working in different communities. So if we understand that there's this connection between cats and people, um, we actually know quite a lot about that. So I'm going to show a couple of different diagrams. Um, this is where cats come from. If you see the cats on the street there, They'll come from four different sources, four root causes of cats being on the street. The top, you have owned cats. They're abandoned, and they end up on the street. Or they're lost, and they end up on the street. They're roaming, so they're owned, but the owners let them out, and they come back in, and they go out, and they come back in. And then the bottom, you have the ones that are actually born on the street. But if we look at this again, Look at that, bit of animation. I wasted too much time on PowerPoint. <laughs> so cats on the street, we have these four categories. Abandoned cats are abandoned by people. Lost cats are lost by people. Roaming cats are pets owned by people. And of course, cats on the street 
are born from other cats, but may have originated from other places. So when we look at this, we have to understand that the role people play in the source of cats. And if we're just addressing cats on the street without understanding where they come from, then we are limiting our ability to be effective in helping these animals and solving the problems. So we know where the cats come from, but who cares from them for them when they're on the street is another important question. It's the other side. So here we have a representative of the total cat population, which is small, it's only seven cats, uh, but the total cat population, and on the left-hand side is confined cats, which are obviously owned. So these are cats that are kept inside of houses. So we're not gonna talk about those today. They may have separate welfare issues and things that we need to discuss, but not today. We're focusing on the right-hand side. So we have roaming cats. And cats that are roaming, cats that are out on the street, will have three forms of care. The first one is owned. Obviously, cats that are owned. Uh, pets that people let out to wander around the street. Then we have the semi-owned cats. These are the ones, like that woman in Greece who feeds them on the street. These are people who have carers in the community that will go out and feed them regularly that will maybe take them to a vet or contact uh, uh, an association, an animal welfare organization, if the animal gets sick. So an owned cat is where somebody points to this cat and says, whose cat is this? And someone will go, yep, it's my cat. Semi-owned is nobody's going to say, that's my cat, but they will say, I'm caring for it. I'm looking after it on the street. And then that last one, that last one is important, actually, unowned because there is a difference between care and reliance. So those two first categories, owned and semi-owned, somebody is caring, actively caring for those cats. But that unowned category, that's, those cats are still reliant on people in some way. They might be scavenging for food, they might be going through dustbins, they might not have somebody regularly giving them food, but it's very rare in an urban environment to find cats that don't have some reliance on people. Maybe in a, in, a, in a rural colony somewhere where the cats are foraging and hunting for themselves. But in the environments that we're talking about, where we work, even unowned cats have a reliance on people. And you can see by the arrows that cats can move between these categories. You have an owned cat that can become unowned. And then within a colony, can be semi-owned and then can become owned again. So cats can move very easily between these categories. So this is kind of the point of what I'm going to be talking about today, or what I am talking about today, which is the barrier to a successful cat population management project. And the biggest barrier is when we don't recognize the attitudes and behaviors of people, of the communities, being aware of these other perspectives. And so the first question is, when we talk about this, who, who are we actually talking about? When I talk about attitudes and behaviors, who, who do I actually mean? Communities is a very general term. So who do we actually mean? Well, we have animal welfare organizations who are very well represented here today. Um, so what are our attitudes and behaviors? Well, our focus is the cats. We care about the cats. We care about their welfare. Uh, we want to do whatever we can to ensure their well-being. Then we have cat feeders and carers. Also, the interest is in the cats. They want to make sure that they are healthy and looked after. Of course, we have cat owners, people who have pet cats. And their priorities may be a little different. Their attitudes and behaviors may be demonstrated differently. They're not maybe concerned about all cats, but they are concerned about their cats. One of the common things that you see with in places where there are stray animals is somebody will go, you know what, I let my cat out on the street and that's fine, but all of these other cats, these are a nuisance, but those other cats might belong to somebody else. The fact is they fail to see the difference between, or th there is a difference or the, sa the same thing between their cat and the ones on the street. So again, it's a different perspective and those attitudes and behaviors change. And these are all people within a wider community. And if we're talking about a large community where there are many, many cats, you have a whole spectrum 
of attitudes and behaviors. You have people that love cats and you have people that hate cats and you have everyone in between. You could have someone that likes cats but doesn't like seeing them on the street. Or you could have someone that doesn't really like cats but doesn't want anything bad to happen to them. So you have all of these different views, all of these different attitudes and all of these different behaviors demonstrated. Of course, we have local government but a government has its own set of attitudes and behaviors and priorities. You could have somebody in a municipality who cares about cats, has cats of their own, but whether that translates into them doing something for cats on the street is going to be very much about the community because municipalities and governments do what they do because the community asks for it. And if the community isn't lobbying for change, lobbying for an improvement in welfare, the municipality doesn't have an incentive to do it. They have to act on the needs of the community. What are their priorities? Priorities of the community. And to get voted in in four years' time. So, um, you know, they have to think about that as well. So they have to, to decide what they want to do based on the needs. Veterinarians, of course, have attitudes and behaviors towards street cats. In some places, vets don't work as well with street cats. I'm not saying here in Spain, I'm talking, as I said, very generally, there are some countries where vets view working with street cats as a threat to their business. Um, but in most places, you find that vets are very supportive of the work of animal welfare organizations and will offer discounted rates and will help out on projects. So again, we're talking about the range of attitudes and the range of behaviors. And then, of course, you have tourists. You have the tourists that like cats or the ones that complain about cats. And these are just a few examples. But we have to recognize that all of these exist. And we have to also recognize that all of these are valid. None of these opinions are wrong that these different people have because they are their opinions. We might not like them, but they're not wrong. And so I mentioned the barriers. What are these attitudes and behaviors? What, what barriers do they present? Well, here is another few examples of the kinds of things that uh, I have encountered in my work. You have places that have no concept of animal welfare. So what do I mean by that? It's, it's, it's people who really don't understand when a cat is in front of them that they don't, they don't recognize that it's suffering, that, that there is a welfare issue. In China, the word welfare doesn't actually have a literal translation. So if you're trying to explain to somebody in China about welfare, how, how do you describe it when there isn't even a word for it? There are many other words that you can use, but that word welfare doesn't exist. People have no interest in animal welfare. Maybe you're living in a poor community where you don't have work, you're struggling to put food on the table, you want to put your children in school, you're struggling to buy clothes. Maybe you don't care about animal welfare. Maybe your concerns are closer to home, and so your priorities are very different. Maybe in a different set of circumstances, you would, you would feel differently. But right now, those are not your priorities. You don't have an interest. There's a problem with cultural and religious mismatch. So uh, for those of us that work in animal welfare, veterinarians, um, and municipalities, we understand what we know about animal welfare based on science and evidence and the projects around the world that are doing work. But that might be different from what people believe because of the culture of the place that they live. And that doesn't make it any less real. They're going to argue, oh, we've always done it this way. Oh, we believe this because of something. And that's different to our belief. And so we have to recognize that their views are different from ours, not because of something is wrong with them, but because of the, the background that they come from. And we have to work out some way of, of, uh, of bringing those two views together. Public health and nuisance. Again, I talked about this just before. If, if somebody doesn't like seeing sick cats on the street or mess or noise or, or, or feces uh, on the street, that's a public health issue. That's a nuisance issue. And so how do you deal with that when you're trying to work towards the welfare of animals? You have to recognize that this is a barrier. We want to save the cats. Yes, but they're making a mess. So what do you do about that? It's a low government priority. Again, what I said before, if the community doesn't want to do uh, to, to address the issue of cats, then what priority is it for the government? 
This is something that I know a lot of animal welfare organizations uh, contend with, is no local allies. Sometimes you feel like you're the only one who's doing it. It's like, oh, why is nobody else helping? Why does nobody else see the problem, want to help these cats? It's, it's something that, that uh, I see and I've worked in and I know happens around the world. And it's very difficult because it's very hard to work on your own and you feel like you're the only one doing it. You're the only one that sees the problem. And then no collaboration. This is also a very big problem in animal welfare. Um, groups that don't work well together. It's hard to believe, I know, but there are some groups that don't like other groups. And it makes it difficult because if you're all trying to do the same thing, then you are dividing your efforts, you're dividing your work. And it's not just how it affects your ability to be successful or effective, but also when you're trying to get other allies if you're working with the government and trying to get legislation or something put in place or lobby for change, why would they listen to one group as opposed to another group when you can't decide between yourselves? It makes it very different to have longer term change if, if you're not collaborating. So these are common issues. These are problems that we see around the world that have to do with attitudes and behaviors. And one of the biggest problems is where the motivations of an animal welfare organization conflict with the wishes of a community. Now in this picture you can decide which is the animal welfare organization and which one is the community. I have my own idea about this but this is entirely up to you. You can interpret it any way you like. Um, but this is a big problem because our motivations as animal welfare organizations is always the cats are a priority. We will never do anything that will jeopardize the welfare of cats. We can't, it's, it's, it's our reason for existing. But we also have to recognize that the communities might not feel the same. And if we are constantly bashing away and telling the community and trying to convince them to believe what we believe, without compromising, without understanding their perspective, then that is gonna create conflict. And it means that we will never go past a certain point working with the community. Doesn't mean we can't do any good at all, but it does mean that we won't be as effective and what we do is unlikely to be sustainable in the long term. Now I talked about you know, the things that we can do, and again, this is, um, this is nothing new, but I thought I'd run through it. We have tools to a comprehensive approach. When I talk about a, 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 a strategy, a plan, what we do to improve the welfare of cats, these are the tools that exist. Education. Education is a word that we throw around a lot. Oh, what do you do in the community? Oh, we educate people. But what does that mean? Because educating children to understand that cats are sentient animals that feel pain and suffering and joy and happiness, um, and educating children about the work that we do that's humane to manage cat populations, that's great. But how do you measure that? I mean, how is that going to impact right now? It's great, it's something we have to do, but we have to recognize its limitations. It is an important part, but it's not the whole, it's not gonna change the world. But then there's adult education. If we talk about pet owners, then we need to understand responsible ownership and that people have to take responsibility for their own animals. If you have a cat on the street, you're responsible for it, just because it's left your house. So we have to educate about that as well. But it won't work on its own. We have legislation. And legislation can be, uh, a good friend of mine once came up with a great phrase, which is legislation can be a tool for good or an excuse to do nothing. So there's good legislation and there's bad legislation. And legislation can protect animals, but it also can limit the work that animal welfare organizations do. Uh, and we have to work within that, but we have to lobby to change it. Registration and identification. Cats are microchipped, cats are, you have collars on, so we can trace them back to their owners. But identification, having an ear tip removed on a feral cat, also identifies it as part of a managed colony. Someone's looking after it, somebody's doing the right job. Sterilization and TNR is always the go-to. It's the number one thing when you have stray cats, when you have a feral cat colony, what are you gonna do? TNR, always. And it is probably the most important tool, but if you just do TNR, 
you're not going to have a successful project because it has to work with all of these other things. You can't just sterilize cats and assume that you're going to solve all the problems with cats because unless you educate people, with the, uh, unless you have legislation that backs it up, unless you can register and identify those cats, unless you can vaccinate and treat and do all of those other things, TNR is only going to have a certain amount of success. So we have all of these tools that we have to work with. Shelters and rehoming centers and foster carers Cats that are able to be rehomed that maybe have been abandoned or lost. Yeah, maybe we want to get those ones off the street. But true feral cats really can't be rehomed or, or you know, they're going to suffer. We have to understand their welfare as street animals. Vaccination and treatment, again, this is both for the welfare of the cats, but also for the, you know, public health issues. And euthanasia, which is the most contentious issue, whenever we talk, we can agree on everything else. It's like, oh, we believe in this with cats and we know the welfare. And then as soon as somebody mentions euthanasia, that's where people start getting angry and start feeling passionate about it because nobody wants to euthanase a cat. And euthanasia should never, ever be for control measures. Should never be at all. But if you have a cat that is suffering, that cannot be treated, that is dying, a horrible death, then euthanasia has to be considered as a welfare often, or option. It has to be, but only in those cases and only as, you know, on a case by case basis. But we can't ignore that this exists. If we really care about cats, we have to acknowledge that sometimes this is a necessary thing that we don't like to do. But all of these tools are hugely important. And it's not about picking one combination and thinking it's going to work everywhere because it's not because no two communities are the same if you have more owned cats and less street cats then that combination that you use is probably going to focus more on education and registration and legislation than it is on TNR but if you are in a community where it's all street cats then TNR is probably going to be your your biggest investment but you have to recognize that you have to adapt um, so how do we ensure that we take this human element into account? What are some of the th general things that we can do? Well, we need to listen to the other side. If we understand that people have different perceptions of things, and different attitudes to things, we have to recognize that. We need to know what we're dealing with. We can't just shout at them and assume that they're going to believe us at some point. We have to understand and assess the situation, which leads into knowing the difference between assumptions and facts. I'm going to talk in a, in a minute about my project in Praia de Faro as an example, but when I was there uh, three years ago, when I just started, I, I did a, a, a sample asking people questions. And I said, uh, how many cats and dogs do you think are here? Because it works on both cats and dogs, the project. And they said, oh, you know, some people said there was 100 cats. Some people said there were 600 cats. It's a, it's a small peninsula. It's an island area on the south coast of Portugal, so it's not big. And then people said, oh, there's 50 or 60 dogs. I said, oh, how many of them are owned and stray? They said, oh, you know, some people said, oh, they're all stray. All the dogs are stray, every single one, and so probably half the cats. And then we did a survey, a full survey over a year. I now have the data for every single dog and every single cat. I know them all. I have pictures of them all. I know where they are. I know their health and their welfare. There is 220 cats and there is 160 dogs. And most of the cats are stray and every single one of those dogs is owned. Every single one, even though most people thought they were all stray. So if I would develop a project to help these animals based on the assumptions of that community, I would be budgeting between 100 and 600 cats and I would think that there was only 60 dogs and I would think that most of them were stray or owned and so how do I plan a project when I don't know those facts? So it's really important to assess and understand a situation before you dive in and do anything. And you need to engage with the community and when I say that I mean really engage. It's not the same as doing a project and then just telling people that you're doing a project. Engaging with the community is having them involved from the very beginning. Really understanding what their needs are and getting them to help with the solutions. Because we need to work to acknowledge everybody's views and sometimes it's not easy because we might not, might not like them but we have to acknowledge them. And we need to lead by example. We need to be the best that we can be. We need to be the kind of people that communities and governments and municipalities feel that they can work with. 
not people who are going to be difficult because ultimately we have to keep our eye on the goal, which is improving the welfare of cats. And so we really need to do what we have to do to get there. And we need to be flexible and adapt because things are always changing. Different places require different tools, as I've already said. Over a year or two years, things change. And so we can't keep doing the same thing. We have to make sure that we adapt to improve things continually. And we also have to acknowledge that sometimes we can't. There are always going to be cases where it's just not the right time. Or we have to think about things differently. So now I'm just going to talk very quickly about Praia de Faro. Uh, this is my project in southern Portugal. It's a four-year project. Um, and we're three years into it. So it's a natural peninsula on the south coast in the Algarve. It's four and a half kilometers long and 750 meters wide. Um, it's an isolated animal population. So you see that bridge up the top? That's the only way on or off, which means cats and dogs will only get there if people bring them. It's a seasonal population, so it's very busy in the summer, hundreds, thousands of tourists, but in the winter, it's a very poor local fishing community. So you have a huge, diverse population there. And there are widespread animal concerns. You have sick animals, underweight animals. So the project was divided over four years in three stages. The first year was stage one. I've made it very technical when I've described it. Finding out about everything before we do stuff. That's, that's really a summary of what we did. Spent a year doing community surveys, asking people about their attitudes and behaviors. Do you have a dog? Do you have a cat? Do you take it to the vet? Do you see street animals? Do you have a problem with street animals? What do you think about them? Really trying to understand the community. But we also did an animal welfare census. We used a mobile phone app, which um, actually they're going to be redeveloping and will probably be available for anyone who wants to use it uh, early next year. And we can GPS locate every single animal, walk around and have a questionnaire and say, is this a male, a female, dog, cat? Is it injured? Is it sick? And we capture all of this data. So we did that for a year. And then in year two, we did CNVR, which is the same as TNR, capture, neuter, vaccinate, release, and welfare interventions. So we, we, we went out there with a team of vets, sterilized 161 cats in 10 days, which was about 68% of the cat population at the time. Um, and then later on, we went back and we did the dogs. And the dogs were slightly different because they were owned. Cats were mostly stray, dogs were mostly owned. So with the dogs, we worked with three local veterinary clinics. So rather than setting up our own clinic, as we did with the cats, we worked out of three local vets. And we sterilized, I think it was 70-something dogs, which was 55% of the population. Um, but we went out into the community. The dogs that we didn't sterilize, we went out. We met with every owner. We vaccinated the dog on site. We wormed. We flea treated. We spoke to them. We offered them food. We were sponsored by Royal Cannon. So we were able to do a lot. And then the last part, we're halfway through. Monitoring and evaluation and community support. So we're seeing if the stuff that we did made a difference. We're doing the same surveys, doing the same um, population census. So we're seeing if people's attitudes and behaviors change because of what we did. And we're also seeing if the animals, their welfare has improved because of what we did. And I can tell you the answer is yes, in every case. From the animal's point of view, we have a healthy community of cats and dogs. When we go back, you know, occasionally you'll see one that has a skin condition and we need to make sure it gets flea treatment. But we have seen incredible improvements. And from the people's point of view, they have engaged with this project in a way that has surprised even me. It's not without its problems. And there are still people that could do more or, or are expecting us to solve all the problems rather than taking responsibility. But, for example, we are now up to, I did a survey in, what month are we now? Did a survey in September, which is the most recent one. And there was three unsterilized cats on the whole of Praia de Pafaro. And we knew about them before we did the survey because the local community had phoned us up and said, ah, somebody's dumped a new cat. So we know in advance the community is helping us do this job. They have taken pride in the fact that they have managed stray animals. I'm just going to show a, a video now of the cat part. Hopefully this is going to play.
Yeah, back to the PowerPoint. Um, so, anybody that's ever used a drone, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> um, so you can see the work that we did there. And it looks fancy because we used a drone and we made a great video, but it was actually not a hugely expensive project to do, but it did take an awful lot of organization. And it meant that we had to work very closely with a lot of partners. We collaborated, you saw at the end, with many, many people in different organizations, and that's really what made it a success. And for me, this quote by one of the people that lives in Praia de Faro, who's a fisherman, actually sums up what we did. And he says, we're very poor, we love our animals, but we have had no way of doing the things we know we should be doing. And this project is one of the best things to ever happen on Praia de Faro. It's changed not only the lives of the animals here, but the people too. And really this is the thing that makes me proudest about the work. Because of course we've saved the lives of animals and we've, we've improved their welfare. But by changing the ideas of the people in the community, we've ensured that if we leave, those animals are still going to be okay. And so this is my final thought, which is if we ever hope to truly make a positive, sustainable difference to the lives of street cats in communities around the world, then we've got to recognize and understand the needs of the people living in those communities. And that's the only way we're really going to make a long-term change. And so with that, I'd like to say thank you.